Good morning, Rethink Church. It's so good to see you in the house of God this morning. You may notice a lot of little people here today. We're combining uh, the, the young people and the adult service together. So it's going to be rambunctious. It's going to be crazy, but it's going to be fun. And we're going to have a good time together this morning, okay? So I invite you to stand on your feet, to sing the songs you know, to lift your hands, and just praise God with us this morning. Amen? Amen. All right. Sing it if you know it. Come, all your sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Come on, for God so loved, for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions. Come and lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. See his open arms for God so His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him Will live forever The power of hell Forever defeated Now it is well I'm walking in freedom For oh, God so loved God so loved the world Thank you for your love, God. And I think that just requires a response from us, church, to just give God praise and honor and glory because he's so good. He loves you that much. In fact, I just want to share with you uh, Psalms 150 as a, as a reminder, right, of our response to him. It says, I'm reading from the message, hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise God in his holy house of worship. That's where we're at today. We're in his holy house. We're worshiping his holy name. Praise him under the open skies. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his magnificent greatness. Praise with the blast on the trumpet. Praise him by strumming soft strings. Praise him with castanets and dance. Praise him with banjo and flute. Praise him with cymbals and a big bass drum. Praise him with fiddles and mandolin. 
Let every living, breathing creature praise God. Hallelujah. 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 And that's my encouragement to you this morning, church, is to praise God. Praise God. Don't worry about the person next to you. I know some of us may feel a little shy, but believe it or not, I'm an introvert, right? So it's, it's, it is a, 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 co a commitment. It is a move of God that I'm up here leading you all in worship. So if I can do it, church, I encourage you. You can do it too. And we're going to do, it's going to be great. It's going to be grand. It's going to be full of his presence. So on this next song, this is just, this is for the youth, right? So typically, you know, we wouldn't do this song in a Sunday service, but we want to mix it up. We want to make it inviting and fun. So I'm going to need your help, right? <laughs> I'm going to let you run right now. I'm going to need your help. So on the course, when it says, Lord, I lift my hands, I encourage you. No, I plead with you <laughs> to lift your hands. Let's get the youth into the song. Let's have a good time this morning with it. Amen. Amen. So it comes right away. You ready? Lord, I lift my hands. Yeah. I give all the praise to you. Everything I am. You give me the strength to do. Lord, I lift my hands. We're having fun now. I give all the praise to you. This is my response for making me brand new. Lord, I can feel your presence. Putting all your peace in me. Lord, I can feel revival. Breaking all the captives free. And though it sounds crazy, man, I used to hate me. Till I met somebody who told me how he made me. How he died and saved me. And if you want the same thing, all you gotta do is just say. Lord, I lift my hands. Where we at? Where we at? I give all the praise to you. Everything I am. Everything I am, you give me the strength to do. Yeah, Lord, I lift my hands. Come on, church. I give all the praise to you. This is my response for making me brand new. And I can't help that, that's just being real. I just walk up to the mic and tell you how I feel. Y'all think I'm religious, I'm just trying to eat a meal. I don't live on bread alone, I'm talking about the zeal. I'm down bad, but you got me better. G-O-D, that's the best three letters. The way you got me, I'm a knee Rosetta. Keep your head up, Lord, I lift my hands. Come on, church. I give all the praise to you. Everything I am, everything I am, you give me the strength to do. Lord, I lift my hands, yeah, yeah. I give all the praise to you. This is my response. Sing it again. This is my response. One more time. This is my response for making me brand new. Come on, don't we have a friend of Jesus? Don't we have a good friend of Jesus? Come on, let me see that lyric on the screen right now. Oh, what a friend I have in you. You're so good, Lord. Oh, what a friend I have in you. You tore the veil to let me through. And all of my stains I've been made new All just because you wanted to Open the gates and flood this room Not even hell can hide from you I feel the colors start to to leave and I refuse. Come on, church, lift your hands. Lord, I lift my hands. I give all the praise to you. Everything I am, yeah. You give me the strength to do. Lord, I lift my hands. I give all the praise to you. This is my response. Let it ride. 
is, this is my response. Oh, to Jesus, this is my response for making me brand new. Come on, any brand new people here today? Anybody new in Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. I just thank you, church, for participating this morning. You made it so much easier. And Lord, we just give you praise and honor and glory. We just thank you for who you are, for what you've done, and who you've been to us, Lord God. We give you all the glory, all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, church. We have a few announcements for you. Good morning. If you are not having fun, you must be asleep still. So wake up. Wake up. We're here. We're doing this today. Um, thank you so much for being here, church. Thanks for participating. I am so grateful that we serve a God who actually exists in fun. What would our kids do? What would our students do if we didn't earn their trust by having fun with them, right? And so that's what we're doing here. That's what we're trying to do for the next generation. So we're going to play a game, all right? Next three weeks are going to be a little different. Just strap yourself in. It's fine. It's going to be all right. So if I ask you as an adult to come up this morning and be a part of the game, adults, if you could be on this side, the three adults, come on up, come up, everybody clap for them because you're sitting in your seats because they're coming up. <laughs> Students, come on over, right over here. So it's going to be adults versus kids. Wait, if I, just you, sir. Yes. Sorry, guys. Not, not this Sunday. I know. That's such a bummer. Next time. Come on, come on, come on over, Lincoln. All right, so what's going to happen is this is a combination of hopping and also playing paper, rock, scissors. The goal, teams, is to get a teammate from this side to this side or from this side to this side without being stopped, okay? So, <laughs> so what's going to happen is you have to hop on every single one of these squares towards one another. When you are one square apart from each other, you do paper, rock, scissors, all right, whoever loses, the loser goes back and the winner keeps hopping. Now, second person in line, you gotta be ready to be up to bat because if your team loses, then whoever is over here, you gotta jump on and try and stop the next person, okay? All right, so here we go. So who thinks the kids are gonna win? Wow, booing, booing. Who thinks the adults are gonna win? Uh-huh. All right, if you do not hit every square, you have to go back. Okay, got it? Are you guys ready? Are you guys ready? All right, ready? One, two, three, go. Okay, here we go, here we go. All right, all right, and just hopping for it, all right. Oh! <laughs> come on, cat. Oh, come on, Lincoln. <laughs> I should have had you sign a waiver. I'm sorry. All right. No injuries can be held against Rethink Church. Okay, go, go, go. All right, Chris. Yes, all the way back. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, okay. Go, go, go. All right. <laughs> okay. Scissors is... Oh, oh. Come on. Let's go, go. Oh, father versus son. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Oh. <laughs> go cat go <laughs> let's see no. I don't. go 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 all right all right Chris and cat Chris and cat okay go 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 come on come on come on cat oh come on let's go Lincoln listen if you are an adult and you haven't hopped in a while it's harder than it looks it's harder than you remember it being <laughs> Go, 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 go. Okay, go, go, come on. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay, go. Here we go. Let's see. All right, all right, all right, all right, right. Here we go. Come on. Let's go, Catalina. Yes, go. Oh, hurry, hurry, go fast, hurry, go fast. All right, you better hit every one or I'm gonna send you back. <laughs> go, go. <laughs> it's like a workout at this point. <laughs> Come on. 
Come on, come on, Eli, let's go. <laughs> Listen, we are not the kind of parents that let our kids just win. Apparent, apparently, not here at the Rethink Church. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Oh, oh. participated. Way to go. That's right. Listen, because I work with the kids, the kids, every kid gets a treat today when you leave. Adults, I'm sorry. No, not for you. So <laughs> thank you guys for playing. You rock. You're awesome. Listen, um, if you love the next generation, if you love the kids that are coming up, or if you're looking for a way to step into a discipleship path, I've had people approach me um, and say, listen, I, I want to volunteer, but I don't know that much about the Bible. Awesome. Come. This is a great place for you to learn the foundational, fundamental things about the Bible, what we believe, and then to pass it on to the next generation. So if you want to volunteer and you can pass a background check and you like to have fun, come see me. We're going to be kicking off again in August, and we would love to have you join our team. We love you. All right, and now for your announcements of this morning. Uh, we just have a couple of quick announcements. The first one is we are going to have a family dedication coming up in August, August 18th. Um, if you are interested in dedicating uh, your family, your children um, to the church and to Christ, um, we have a mandatory class on July 28th. Um, so sign up for the class, and then we'll have our family dedication on August 18th. So we're looking forward to um, loving on our families, praying over our kiddos, uh, things like that. So uh, mark your calendars for the 18th. And then if you are new or visiting with us, welcome. Um, we are not always this much fun because sometimes we have to send our kids back to kids' ministry so that they can have fun without us. But um, we do have kids with us for the month of July, um, except for the nursery. Um, and then in August, they'll return back to their normal schedules. Um, but if you're new, uh, come visit us at guest services. We've got a gift for you guys just for being here. Love to answer any questions you might have. Um, and then lastly, I just want to thank you guys who... Um, Call Rethink Church home, and you believe in the vision and mission of Rethink Church and give um, because of your gifts uh, and generosity. We're able to do what we do, not just on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week and also around the world for our missions. So thank you, guys. Um, there's two ways to give here at Rethink Church. You can give in person, the black box by the door, or you can give online at rethinkchurch.cc. We're going to go into one more worship song now. All right, I just invite you to stand on your feet again. We're going to worship God. We thank you, Jesus. We just invite you, Holy Spirit, to have your way today. You're welcomed here, Lord. we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you. Let's sing holy. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in 
bring your love to those around me. That's our prayer today, God. Let's sing worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy. Worthy of all the praise we could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, you're holy, holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you are and who. With your heart and lead me in your love to those of sing holy, holy. There is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and feel me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and i will build my life upon your love it is open foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is open foundation I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be Let's sing, I will build, and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone and i will not be sing holy holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes and wonder show me who you are and feel me with your heart and lead me in your love to those who sing holy, holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me. In your love to those around me, and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be ashamed. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. 
salvation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. Oh, we trust you, God. And we will not be shaken, Lord. Because we trust you, God. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. Amen, Lord. That is our prayer today. In this season where there is so much going on in this world, in our nation, we have to put our trust in you. We choose to put our trust in you, God. We thank you that you are in control. You are the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. Thank you that you are the ruler over this nation, over this earth, over the cosmos, God. And we have precious hope because of you. Lord, let us be a light to those around us. Let us share your love, your hope, your salvation, your grace and your mercy, and be your ministers of reconciliation in our spheres of influence, God, because this world needs you, and you've entrusted us with that task. So we thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides us, and we thank you that we can spend time in your presence, filling up in, on your promises, and reminding ourselves of who you are and of your goodness. We ask that you bless this sermon, the rest of this service, and let us take the lesson with us through the rest of our week today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There once was a young man named David. He was a shepherd who looked after his father's sheep, but God had bigger plans for him. One day, he took his brother's lunch at the battlefield. He heard a giant of a man making fun of God. That man's name was Goliath. Everyone was scared of Goliath, but not David. With only a sling and five stones, David met Goliath in the valley between the armies. David had five stones, but he only needed one. He struck Goliath and the giant fell down dead. The army of Israel rejoiced because God helped a young man named David have victory. Never be afraid of the big, scary things in your life. With God's help, you can do anything. All right. Well, hey, good morning. Welcome to church. My name is Mark. I'm the pastor of our church. And yes, this month is one of my favorite months that we do at church. And the reason we do kind of what we do is a couple things. We do not want our students to wonder what's going on in here and be like, oh, I don't know what it's church like. The other part of it is we want to kind of show the adults, this is kind of the elements of what kids ministry happens. And so we'll do some of these things. We're going to have a shorter message, and then we're going to have some discussion because that's what the kids do. They actually discuss it in Sunday morning. So enjoy that. You get to know each other. You get to talk to each other. So, um, and we'll figure that part out. So now we're going to talk about one of my, like this is probably in, outside of Jesus. This is the most popular passage or story uh, of the Bible uh, and all that. Sports figures use it. It's always a term of something like the underdog and all that. David and Goliath, if you ever hear that kind of stuff, this is the event we're talking about, right? And so it, like from the, from the outlooks, it looks like, man, this is a kind of a weird fable or t weird thing. But if you actually look at it through the military lens, you're like, oh, there's some real things here. So in the ancient world, uh, the warfare, there's three major parts of, a, of an army, and it was kind of like a massive game of paper, rock, scissors. And so here's how it's going to work out. We're going to go through this, okay? So the infantry was in the first one. They're hand-to-hand -hand combat people. They have weapons upon weapons upon weapons. And as a unit, as a group, 
they could defend the second and probably the third ones a little bit better, uh, but we'll get into those. But if you are isolated by yourself, then you're exposed. So as a group, though, they would have all these kind of daggers and spears and all this. They would have uh, swords, backup swords. They would have their own shields. They would actually train to move as a unit and, and like train and defend themselves with the shield. Most of the time, they would never rely on a communication error. So they would never have a shield there. They would never have somebody be like, hey, can you stand right here? What if the guy was off a little bit? Who's to blame if you get dead, right? Is it the shield bearer's fault? Is it your fault? So they're like, well, that's like high risk. So let's just do this and we'll just train and do it ourselves, right? So the second group was the cavalry. These are the horse, the tanks. They're the tanks of the day. But they had horses and chariots and all this and other kind of equipment. And they could easily take ground very quickly uh, but they could be defeated by the infantry if they worked as a unit. They, were, they would easily defeat the third group because they were too fast to move and they couldn't get a good aim on them. So the third group, though, are the archers, the projectile launchers. And so these are the bow and arrow people, the archers, the slingers. Like a slingshot was a legit weapon in the, in the ancient world. Uh, they were kind of like the snipers of, inf- of the ancient world. Um, <clears throat> so they could defeat the infantry because all they had to do was find the weakness and shoot them. Right, uh, the and to and the like, the Roman Empire they had special tongs used to remove the stones embedded into uh, their opposing enemies because of the slings. That's how like the sling the the velocity of a stone coming out of a sling was like the handgun equivalent. It was pretty impressive. Now we wear helmets in baseball because we don't like cork and all that stuff. But stones and sometimes even like metal like they would melt down metal into balls for slings and stuff like that. And so these are like massively important. So uh, they would have people that go hunting and they would go hunting birds and they would shoot them out of the air using a sling and a stone. That's how accurate they were. The Irish rebels had these uh, slingers who could hit a a coin up to like a hundred yards away. There's a book in the, uh, there's a civil war that's going to take place in the book of Judges in the Bible. And it talks about left-handed slingers could hit a target within a hair's width of each other consistently over and over and over again. This is a legit way of doing this. Does that make sense? So here's the paper rock scissors version of this. Uh, Calvary could def- would easily defeat uh, the archers. All they do is like wait, them f- wait for them to run out of armor like or weapons and be like, okay, now I can run you over because that's what they would do. Uh, the infantry could withstand the cavalry, but they would get defeated by the slingers or the, or the projectile launchers. Projectile launchers would get defeated by the cavalry and all that. You can see how this kind of keeps himself in check, right? So the place that this is going to take the, the this event is going to take place is in a place called the Shafala region. The Shafala region. There's going to be a map up here. Uh, it's this space. <clears throat> now, we don't really see the mountain ranges that are on here. So you have the Mediterranean Sea, you have the coastal highway, and then you have this mountain range. And people back in the ancient world decided we should work smarter, not harder. And so we would travel through the valleys, not over mountains. If you had to choose, would you go through a valley or would you climb over a mountain? I'm going to walk through the valley, right? So that's what they would do. So that where the Dead Sea is, right about like to the, uh, to the east of it, there's a mountain range and there's called a Ridge Highway or King Highway. These two spaces connect three continents. It's the most traveled and fought over piece of land in the ancient world. It connected Africa, Europe, and Asia. So if you control this space, you control the trade routes, you control the imports and the exports and all that. It is fought over more, like over and over again. So the Ajalon Valley, this is where Joshua and the sun stands still with the Battle of Ai takes place. The Soric Valley is where Samson and all the Philistine takes place and stuff like that, Jawbone, all that kind of stuff. Uh, And so the Valley of Elah is one of these spaces as well. Later on, you're going to see the Maccabeans and the Greeks fight in the Ajalon Valley as well. Uh, this is where the Maccabean Revolt and all that. In the Middle Ages, around like the Crusades are going to take place in here. This is where Saladin and the Crusades will take place in these valleys. This is a space that is fought over, over and over again. It's a normal, it's like, all right, turn of the decade, here's the next battle. You know what I mean? Uh, and stuff like that. So here's the Elah Valley. This is where the Philistines and they are going to come. They're going to make their camp. They're going to start doing this. And then Saul and the Israelites are going to come basically where the tree line is. And they're going to stand right there, right? It doesn't look that impressive unless you're down on the ground and you're looking up. Here's the next picture. You'll see how steep some of this is. 
So if you go into the valley, you're like, oh, this is why you don't bring the entire army. The whole, the whole thing that Goliath is going to do, challenging the, the whole army of Israel, is saying, send us out your best soldier. This is a, what we call single combat. This is a way that traditionally would have been done. Uh, when there's a civil war in uh, David, and when David is going to take over from Saul, there's a civil war. The both generals get together from Saul's army and David's army and say, hey, just give us three guys, and let's settle the battle that way. If you watch the movie Troy with Brad Pitt, this is the opening scene. This is a legit way of doing this, right? When 40 years old was a pretty old person in the ancient world, they're like, well, we can't kill everybody off. So let's just have handfuls of people, right? And so this is the, how steep this valley is. He's, he's expecting hand-to-hand combat. What, what I'm going to read in a little bit, just think through what kind of, infant, what kind of soldier is Goliath. Here is the next, pic- next picture which is the dry bed. It's a dry creek bed. It's no longer there anymore, but it's dried up now. You can see the evidence of it and stuff like that. So <clears throat> let me just read the opening parts of First Samuel chapter 17. So use this as you keep, in, keep that stuff in mind. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war. And they assembled at Soka and Judah. They pitched their camp at Ephesus uh, and Demene and Soka and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites was, was assembled their, uh, in the valley of Elah. They drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines, kind of stopping them there. The Philistines occupied one hill. The Israelites occupied another hill. Those are the two sides of the valley, right? And then the valley is in between them. And then a champion named Goliath, who's from Gath, came out, to the Philistine, uh, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span. Basically, he's over like around nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet. And his head was a, uh, on his head, and he wore a coat of scale of armor that weighed 5,000 shekels or 150 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, basically shin guards. He had a bronze javelin slung on his back. His spear was a shaft, it was like a weaver's rod, and the point of it was iron, uh, weighed about 15 pounds as an iron point. His shield bearer went ahead of him. So think about this what kind of warrior is Goliath dressed like? Is he going for hand-to-hand combat, or is he going for hand-to-hand combat, right? He has all these weapons upon weapons upon weapons, right? Now, the iron tip of his thing, that's, that's, this would be a key to understanding what kind of weaponry he, they have. The Philistines are these people from Crete who have come down into the Mediterranean Sea area where they're at, and he, they, they will not go attack Egypt. There's no point. They would be wiped out. But the small little nation of Israel, we can pick on them. And we can take over this land, and we can expand into these lands, right? But they're technologically advanced. This is during the Bronze Age, and they have iron weaponry, which if you notice the the metals and stuff like that, they progressively get stronger and faster and all this, right? Iron would easily pierce any bronze shield, any bronze helmet, and all this. So the fact that he has an iron spear, or the tip of an iron spear, is crucial. This, This would be like, oh... Bring a knife to a gunfight type of a thing. You know what I mean? Like, why would you even try? Bow and arrows and all that. So this is, this is a crucial, this gives us an idea of the, this kind of a technologically advanced. Now, also, when you look at the other passages, you realize that only Jonathan and Saul are the only ones with swords. So here's an army of men who really don't have a lot. You're like, maybe they have some pitchforks. Maybe they have some other, like, sticks, Right? But they're like, I don't know how we're going to go against this battle of like this army that's full of weapons, right? And so uh, you have all these kind of battles and going on, stuff like that. Um, and so this is easily what would have been done. And so as you look through this and read through the passage, you can easily see how the Israelite army would be a little bit afraid, right? If you have no weapons, how do you fight an army full of weapons, right? And then you have this giant like little giant, who has a champion, like he's been fighting since he was a youth, and he has a pretty good reputation. So great, now what? Right? So listen to this. Here's what 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 11 says. On hearing the Philistines' words, so Goliath comes out, and he basically starts making fun of God. He starts making fun of the Israelite army, and he's like, I defy you. Why don't you send your best soldier out here? On hearing these words, the Philistines' words, Saul, who's the king, and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Another way of saying they're afraid, right? 
So here is, I love this definition by Dan Allender of uh, fear. Uh, it's out of the book, Cry of the Soul. Fear is our response to uncertainty about, the, about our resources in the face of danger. When we are assaulted by a force that overwhelms us and compels us face to face, that we are helpless, it, helps us, it makes us face the fact that we're helpless and out of control. Fear is provoked when the threat of danger, physical or relational, exposes our inability to preserve what we deeply cherish the most. When you can't protect the things that you deeply cherish, that's when fear usually kicks in. And here's Saul, and here's the Israelite army, and they're terrified. But reading this, you wouldn't know that they're terrified, right? Because what are they doing? Every day they're getting up, and they are starting in their battle formations according to the scriptures, which means they're getting through like the battle cries, the war cries, and stuff like that. They're kind of like these people right here. So you have NFL fans who dress up. They put face paint on. They get all like masculine, right? Put on all this makeup. They put on costumes, right? They even bedazzle their shoulder pads. You can take a look at this one right here, right? Now, they're going to go through the motions of cheering people on, of trying to intimidate the other fans. They're going to tell the players how bad they are, which, by the way, if you got impressed, like, who would be intimidated by the Seahawks people? I would just laugh at them. You know what I mean? Like, ooh, you have a wig on. You know, like, terrifying. So, <clears throat> uh, or cheese heads. And he's like, I want, we won't go there. But anyway, how intimidating can cheese be? Unless you're lactose intolerant, right? <laughs> so, but anyway, so you have these guys on Sunday mornings who dress up, they get all this stuff done, they go through the whole motions, they're going to yell, they're going to scream, they're going to cheer, but will they ever step foot on a football field and take a hit from an NFL player? Probably not, and probably not live to talk about it, right? This is the Israelite army. They're standing on the sidelines, they're going through the motions, they're acting as if they're an army, but they have no weapons, they're terrified out of their minds, and they're just going through the motions trying to fake it until they make it, right? Right? Meanwhile, six miles or so to the east, or sorry, to the west, there's a guy named Jesse who has three older sons who are at the battle line who should be fighting, but they're not fighting because they're terrified. They're going through the motions. Jesse's like, hey, David, to the younger son, who's not 20 years old, so he's not a military age. He's probably 16, 17 years old. He's tending the sheep, and he's going back and forth, according to the scriptures, trying to figure out what's going on at the battle lines, right? And so he's doing exactly what his dad has asked him to do. He shows up. And he hears Goliath making fun of the God and the army and all that. And he, start, he leaves his stuff with the people, the keeper of the supplies. And he goes in and he says, hey, what the heck's going on? And one of the guys is to say, whoever defeats Goliath, man, their family is going to be wealthy. King Saul is going to give his daughter's hand in marriage to him. And he'll be free of taxes. Sign me up. You know what I mean? I'll go fight a giant if I'm free of taxes. If I win, great. If I don't, at least I tried. You know what I mean? So there's that. Anyway, so David's like, well, is no one going to do anything? A couple chapters before, the Israelites cry out to God, give us a king. We want to be just like every other country. We want this king to fight our battles for us. They're expecting Saul to step into this battle. And Saul's up at a tent going, I'm not doing that. But they got what they asked for. That's his name. His name literally is, is what you got what you asked for. That's the meaning of his name. So here's Saul, who should be in the battle. Here's an entire army who should be in the battle, and no one's stepping forward. And David's just asking questions. And his older brother, Eliab, gets so upset. He's like, what are you doing, you conceited little boy? Who's tending these few sheep with me? Have you ever been caught doing something you, you are you not doing anything, but you should be doing something? You got caught doing the wrong things? This is Eliab right here. Eliab should be in the battle, but he won't, he's not in the battle. And here's a guy who has no business trying to get into the battle, trying to get in the battle. David has no reason to get in this battle. He, like, there's no obligations at all, other than you're making fun of God and you're defying the Israelite army. So is no one going to step up for this? And so he does. Word gets to King Saul. By the way, scriptures tell us that King Saul stands a head taller than any other Israelite. His armor would be tailored to that size right? And he says, okay, well, if you're going to fight this battle, David, then you have to do it dressed as an infantry soldier. Goliath battle expecting is going to be expected as an infantry soldier. Did he say that? No. 
but he's showing up as an infantry soldier. King Saul expects him to go out there. So he's like, hey, if you're going to fight this battle, at least put my, my armor on, right? David does it, and he can't, he can't even walk in it. And he's like, forget this. He takes his armor off, he put, grabs a sling and his staff, and he's about to head in. And, and Saul's like, by the way, why are you doing this? Do you have any ability to do this? And he's like, I've seen a lion and a bear, and I've killed them too. This Philistine will be no different, right? So he grabs his stuff, and he starts heading in there, and Goliath sees this, and the, the scripture says that he starts inching towards him, and his, so him and his shield bear are there and saying, man, what's going on? And David's going into the valley, goes to the, to the creek, grabs five smooth stones. Why? In case he misses, he has some backup ones. I don't think David had a clue that Goliath is going to have some brothers. That'll come out later, but like, would you really just grab one bullet and hope for the best? No, you're going to take some backup, right? And some backup upon your backup. So this is what David's doing. He's just grabbing five smooth stones. Now, Goliath's going to say something that's a little peculiar, right? He says, come to me so that I can defeat you. The battle is completely different if Goliath stops him before the creek. Have you ever thought about that? See, when we look at something out of fear, we get frozen. This is what happens with Saul, and this is what happens with the Israelite army. They look at this, they get terrified, and they won't do anything. So they just stand there and look at it. And they see how big and impressive and successful Goliath has been in the past, and they realize that we can't do anything about it. When David looks at him, he sees it out of faith. And it actually empowers him. Because I think there's something else going on here. I think there's actually something wrong with Goliath. Why would an, armor, why would an infantry soldier need a shield bearer? Would you, would you re- trust your life on a communication error in the middle of battle? Especially when shield bears are the only, they're only reserved for royalty and for archers and slingers because of the, during their motion, they're exposed. Shield bears are not meant for hand-to-hand combat soldiers. And why does Goliath say, come to me? Why can't Goliath go to him? Right? And how many sticks does David have? Only has one. Why does Goliath say, come, like, am I a dog that you come in with six, multiple or plural? Is Goliath seeing everything correctly? Is Goliath maybe a little slower than he should be? Is he, like, his past success is such a good reputation, impressive, that it's frozen everybody else, but David could look at him and be like, there's an exposed area, all I have to do is hit him in the head and cut his head off? I mean, he's not a trained soldier, and that's what he does, right? When we look at something out of fear, and we get afraid, and we get frozen, it's easy to get overwhelmed. And when we look at something through the lens of faith, because what God has already done for us in the past, and we get to mobilize, be empowered by that, then we can step into it and do this. And this is exactly what David does, right? He looks at him and says, man, you're going to come in with a sword, spear, and a a dagger, but I'm going to come at you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. And after I cut your head off, imagine that, after I cut your head off, and the birds of the air pick your body apart, and the carcass is going to be offered to this land of the animals, then everybody will know that there's a God in Israel. So he does it. He takes one stone, puts it in the sling, and hits him right in the head. And he doesn't trust it. Like, have you watched a movie and you watch people, like, kids, don't watch this, but, like, they go through the motions of, like, in action movies, and they're like, all you do is one more bullet in the head, and it would have been a completely done movie. And instead, he left him alive, right? Yeah. David's like, forget this. And he goes and takes the sword, and he cuts his head off, and he takes the head of Goliath to King Saul. That makes sense right? But then he goes even further, and he goes to Jerusalem, who, by the way, is not an Israeli city yet. And he says, here's the head of Goliath, which is a weird thing to do, right? I'm sure the king of of Jerusalem was like, awesome, what do we want me to do with this, right? But I do know this, and I have no, I don't really know why, but I do know that when we as Christians, the people who want to live for justice, allow evil to run wild, and we don't stand up against it, there will be more victims than we ever thought. But if we want to stand up for justice and we want to stand up for righteousness and we as Christians stand up against those things, then we'll protect more people than we ever thought. And I think this is kind of what's going on. This battle of Eli is a, a, like one step away from a checkmate for the whole region. And David's like, hey, I've taken care of this. You guys have lived in fear and were frozen by it. I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to step in and see the empowerment and go from there. So this is exactly what he does. So here's a couple of takeaways that I have for us. Number one, don't get overwhelmed by fear. Just look through things in faith, right? 
um, and, and start looking through that lens of like, okay, God, what's the opportunity here, right? The second one is this. This is all a precursor to the previous, or sorry, the, the next coming battle that's going to take place in a thousand years from this, where Jesus, who has no, no real reason to get into a battle with you and I over e- like for evil and stuff like that, he steps in and he's our champion for us. He fights a battle on his terms and not on our terms. David fought the, ter- fought the battle on his terms, not on Goliath's terms. Does that make sense? So like he doesn't, he doesn't wait for that kind of stuff. The question I will ask for you is if you had to identify with a character in this event, what character would you want to be? We all want to say David, right? But really we're not. You're the Eliab. If you're Goliath, you need to stop being a bully and trying to push your own agenda, right? Let's not be Goliaths here. But most of us are probably either an Israelite army or King Saul, where we're just watching things take place, but we're not willing to stand into the, like, get up for it. This, here's the second takeaway that I have for us. Live in victory. Our champion stepped into a battle and fought the battle on his terms, and he defeated sin, and he defeated the power of sin. Imagine if the Israelite army saw this t- whole thing take place and they just kept cheering, they kept getting in their battle formations, but they never pursued the plunder of the Philistines. Imagine if we just did that as Christians, where we saw the victory and we just constantly go through the motions of just getting up, doing our battle formations, wondering why we don't live in victory. Why don't we have more of resources and stuff like that? And so part of what we need to do is start living into that, the victory that God has given us through Christ. We have a champion who does this. Now, here's what we're going to do for the rest of the time. You're going to break into groups. I've already asked some people to facilitate some discussions. So if you are a discussion leader, just go ahead and stand up. People around you are going to find you, and you're just going to start leading those discussion groups. So Abby's going to be in the back. Kim is going to be up here in the front. Russell's going to be up here in the front. Roland will be in that back. So get in your groups. You don't have to go through all the questions. Just go through some of them, okay? And then I'll come and dismiss us.